మిమ్మల్ని ఇద్దరిని వేదికల అలంకరించిన పెద్దలకి నా చోటి సోదరి సోదరి మండలి గుట్టుకో మ్యామ్ గుట్టుకో స్టార్ట్ అయిందా గుట్టుకో so good evening everyone welcome you all to the emergency uh, educational series of ashoda hospitals today we have an interesting topic recess rumble balancing cardiac and neuro emergencies in the emergency department today we have eminent faculty from cardiology dr ravikant senior consultant cardiologist from somaji guda ashoda hospitals and dr mohan krishna senior consultant neurologist from ashoda hospital somaji guda so today we are going to delve into the interesting aspect of neuro and cardiac emergencies and i hope the session is going to be very informative and enlightening to the emergency physicians dr ravikant uh, senior ca consultant cardiologist will be taking over and presenting his aspects of cardiac emergencies and uh, what are the aspects that we have to look in when the patient presents to us in the emergency department over to you dr ravikant garu uh thank you dr uh, sojanya and uh, uh thanks to all my colleagues uh, for giving this opportunity and uh, thanks ashoda as well uh, for organizing this kind of uh, session which is quite interesting this topic uh, in fact uh, has uh, incited a uh, lot of interest and enthusiasm in me to search for lot of articles in fact i i have spent lot of time uh, in uh, understanding myself as well as how to in uh, give a message to all the doctors uh, either in er or, or in neurology or in cardiology wherever uh, the clarity of treating this subset of patients uh, has to be finally uh, uh, taken as uh, taken uh, to home as a message so i tried my best to uh, understand first and i don't know whether i would uh, make you understand uh, about this uh, uh, actually not rumble it is a jumble so it's a, it's actually very difficult uh, to understand a situation wherein you have two things at a time so we are talking about cardio neuro emergencies fine but in that we are our topic today is uh, actually acute ischemic stroke and acute uh, coronary syndrome which are simultaneously there so it's uh, you you can call it has cardio cerebral infarction you can call this entity as a cardio cerebral infarction and uh, you can call it as hyper acute cardio cerebral infarction if they have come very early with both of them together so this kind of scenario how many times uh, any doctor would have faced Uh, in er or uh, in ca in cardiac icu or in neuro icu uh, i i can count on fingers in this past uh, uh, 20 years of experience i have seen uh, both of these being there and presenting to the hospital uh, in three patients i am talking about acute ischemic stroke acute cardiac uh, coronary syndrome at once there there are other things wherein uh, you can find uh, other entities the entities uh, which uh, you can talk about are like for example atrial fibrillation with a uh, acute uh, ischemic stroke which is quite common you can have a cardiomyopathy with acute ischemic stroke which is quite common and you can have a cardiac uh, uh, disease with a uh, seizure disorder in uh, uh, er which is quite uh, often you see and similarly you can have different kind of com combinations of a neurological event and new cardio cardiac event if you remove about ischemic and the word of ischemia if it is removed you have lot of uh, combinations uh, wherein uh, you find in er uh, coming to the er patient with uh, neurology and cardiology problems but, so this is a, totally a topic which excludes all these and most commonly uh, we get associated uh, leave about er because the patient would not be in er but patient would be in cath lab wherein we do a percutaneous intervention and then they end up with a uh, ischemic stroke this is quite common and very rarely hemorrhagic stroke so this this event this combination is quite common and here actually er people would be 
sidelined. It is directly neurologist will come into picture and interventional radiologist will come into picture. So this is quite common. But then we are talking about acute ischemic stroke in uh, uh, acute ischemic stroke and acute coronary syndrome. So I want to talk first on acute coronary syndrome. So what is our uh, understanding of acute coronary syndrome? What we are going to do? So by this time, I think everyone knows the pathophysiology of the acute coronary syndrome. In acute coronary syndrome, what happens is you have a plaque. There is a plaque which would fissure and lead to a sudden occlusion because of a formation of clot, which can be fibrin-rich, which can be platelet-rich. So if you have a platelet-rich uh, thrombus, you get a non-ST elevation MI which is called NSTMI, unstable angina syndrome. So this is one entity where the patient can present with ischemic stroke as well. And you can have an ST elevation MI, which happens with the block rupture, occlusive thrombus, which is fibrin rich. So fibrin rich, this is called red clot. The other one is called white clot. So the white clot entity is present, the people present with NSTMI and the red clot people will present with the ST elevation MI. So leave about what they have other, otherwise. Uh, leave about patient having an acute ischemic stroke. But the patient coming with this kind of situation, the acute coronary syndrome, the spectrum would be either ST elevation MI, non-ST elevation MI. Uh, and if you take non-ST elevation MI, you can also classify it as a high-risk NST elevation MI. So you can see in this slide, this is... Uh, high risk NSTES and uh, ST elevation MI and very high risk NST elevation MI. So here uh, we, uh, the approach, this, this slide was taken actually from ESC guidelines, latest guidelines 2023. Uh, and I always keep saying that the guidelines are not the guidelines as recently uh, Dr. Mohan Krishna also told, uh, has given this statement. It's not a guideline, it's a guideline. But then the guidelines have come to understand and go with a at least not overdo or underdo uh, keep uh, in a, a proper track and follow it so here to for a, even even a, any doctor any specialty to understand uh, the acs can be approached as acs a, a means abnormal ecg c means we look at clinical context and s is stable patient so we are talking about in, in our picture, the patient presenting to ER with uh, both the things, will be, the, the patient will have an abnormal ECG. And if you have an ST elevation MI, so here you can see, if you have an ST elevation MI, you have two options, going for fibrinolysis or primary PCI. Okay, so I'm, uh, leave about, I'm, I'm talking about ACS. Leave about AIS. Of course, we should not leave, but as of now, you leave it because just go through uh, how did we arrive at this uh, uh, flow chart we'll go through. Uh, the other one is, so ST elevation MI, the options are primary PCI or fibrinolysis. Actually, fibrinolysis is dotted lighter. You see here, this is because wherever possible, you are going to do primary PCI. The centers where it is not possible, you like uh, the door to balloon time would be longer, for example. Or if you are, if you have to ship the patient to a cath lab center and it is quite long, uh, quite away, so then you fibrinolyze them with a fibrinolytic. It's called thrombolytic. Actually, it means fibrinolytic because it lies the lysis happens with the fibrin. So the next is an ST elevation MI. So where there is no ST elevation, as I was telling you, it is a white clot which happens. And here you go for an immediate angiography, immediate angiography, and then according to the situation inside, you go for a PCI. Then high risk uh, NST ACS, here you would go early for a PCI, not uh, immediately. So less than 24 hours, you would take eventually, like patient comes in the night, you take him in the morning. So this is how, the invasive management is in uh, acute coronary syndrome and then the antithrombotic therapy. So I'm talking about all this because each step is a controversy when you have a ischemic stroke. Because this, this controversy comes from the understanding of the uh, neurologist uh, regarding the pathology, pathophysiology and, and evidence from their side. So, uh, so 
think about the first step keep in your mind the first step the invasive management then comes the antithrombotic therapy what what you are going to do you have done whatever like primary pci fibrinolysis or a pci for nst emi the next step is you have to have aspirin in the prescription aspirin in the prescription and p2y12 inhibitor this this is what we know that it is clopidogrel earlier earlier there was ticlopidin which was not there anymore because of its uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Now we have a ticagrelar and prosigrel in the shelf, very potent uh, 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 things. And especially first one year, you have an evidence that the mortality is low. The, you have a lower mortality with uh, uh, the ticagrelar when compared to other antiplatelets in the first year of any acute coronary syndrome. So you have a mortality benefit as well in antiplatelet agents. And then you have an unfractionated heparin or lomalclobate heparin. And then, of course, there are fondaparinox and bivalidin as well as an anticoagulant therapy. But then the evidence of bivalidin being there, uh, still it, it is not at accepted in a lot of uh, centers. It's majority we use unfractionated heparin or a lomalclobate heparin. So then you also have to understand this, this is all we spoke about is a acute coronary syndrome. You have a stable patient. Of course, this is not the topic to understand here. But then you please, you, I'm just telling you that even here you have a role of PCI, CABG, medical management. And then you can always consider the guides to make uh, your PCI perfect with intravascular imaging or intravascular physiology to understand with FFR. So uh, then comes the last picture, secondary prevention. So this table remains same, whether you have a ischemic stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, whatever. This remains same uh, as it is. So now uh, let's see uh, what happens, what, what is in acute ischemic stroke and acute myocardial ST elevation MI. So what is, the, what is the difficulty? What is the controversy? What is the difficulty? So... Why can't you take an ST elevation MI straight away for a uh, primary PCI? So this is one of the kinds of studies. Uh, this is, uh, see, 2024, this comes in a neurology uh, uh, magazine, which is a stroke magazine, which is a part of AHA, American Heart Association. So here uh, it is uh, Shivani Mehta and et al. You see acute myocardial infarction may concomitantly occur with acute ischemic stroke. The prevalence, complications, and outcomes of acute ST segment elevation in patients hospitalized with ischemic strokes, ischemic stroke, are not well studied. Why this happens? Why why does this happen? Why there is no uh, uh, good data or study is actually because of number of patients. See, you have two lakh patients, for example, two lakh patients of uh, uh, ischemic stroke. The patients with ST elevation MI would be less than 6,000. So when you look at this, it is 0.3% of people who have an acute coronary syndrome. So that is 3 out of 1,000 patients will have acute coronary syndrome. So you get to see these patients in your lifetime very few. So whatever you do in multi-center data also, you cannot find a big numbers. So this is one of the studies where you can see the concomitant STMI ischemic stroke outcomes of PCI. Number, look at this number. This is in 2 lakh patients of stroke, they could pick up 6,275 patients. And acute ischemic stroke, I just want to conclude uh, this uh, study. The ST elevation MI, 28% uh, patients with concomitant acute ischemic stroke and ST elevation MI died. They died. Only 14% underwent PCI and odds ratio, if you see, it is actually uh, not associated with increased mortality. That means the PCA, doing a PCA in ischemic stroke patients has not increased mortality. It is, it, it, it is what we want. So there is no big intracranial hemorrhage, which people are afraid of because you give heparin during the procedure and you give uh, antiplatelet agents. And uh, then uh, the neurologist gets worried about uh, having these side effects. So uh, uh, this particular thing, ST elevation MI, can be intervened with uh, percutaneous intervention, which is primary PCI. 
as per this you can understand the odds ratio has been not uh, much bad so it's something like non inferior then we'll go through uh, one more this thing here coronary disease in patients presenting with acute ischemic stroke or transient ischemic attack and uh, elevated troponin levels so here they wanted to understand how many people have the elevated troponin levels how false is the ele elevated troponin levels not representing acute coronary syndrome is it always acute coronary syndrome or is it not and uh, they, this is a retrospective study they have not influenced anything so they have taken data retrospectively here you can see uh Acute is the keywords acute ischemic stroke, transient ischemic attack, elevated troponin levels, and myocardial infarction. And uh, so, what are the outcomes? So, let's see here. So, 8,322 patients with uh, acute ischemic stroke or transient ischemic attack. Uh, the people who were excluded are not TA troponin not elevated, either not measured, or if you have measured more than 48 hours after, after admission. So these people are uh, excluded. So majority are so. And then troponin elevated patients, out of 8,322 patients, it is 2,205 patients who are actually having a troponin elevation. And remember, this is for ER people to understand. It's not always troponin elevation is not a cardiac issue. So you have a lot of uh, 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 things which will happen. The troponin can come from several places. And uh, it can be falsely elevated with... Uh, uh, hypertrophic heart, it can be falsely related with uh, situations where afterload is there like accelerated hypertension, malignant hypertension. So here you can see, uh, in fact, uh, these people were, uh, there were 2,082 people who were excluded because they don't have an evidence of MI. So um, understand 1,400 patients have no MI. Please understand. So it is not always acute coronary syndrome, which is responsible for troponin elevation. And the pre-morbid conditions who have this 259 were excluded. Who died, we cannot do angio, of course, that's done. Bleeding risk. And people, some people uh, refused the angiography. So finally, coronary angiography was uh, done in uh, 123 patients out of uh, 2,205 with troponin elevation. And you again find only obstructive coronary artery disease in small percentage of people. Uh, that is hardly 51 patients. So even when 123, it is majority non-obstructive disease. Here, non-obstructive statement of non-obstructive uh, disease there was less than 50% of, uh, actually less than 50% is called non-obstructive. But in this paper, they have chosen less than 80% as a non-obstructive coronary artery disease. So let it be. Finally, here, the PCI has been done in 47 patients. And in fact, they followed it up and you can see AS patients with large artery atherosclerosis. Of course, this classification comes from the stroke uh, uh, department. I think neuro that I, I, I uh, Dr. Mohan will know this. So large artery atherosclerosis, uh, uh, there is clinical presented asymptomatic large artery atherosclerosis and a small embolic uh, as well as small artery uh, atherosclerosis. So uh, you have here uh, uh, this accumulation you can just look at this rate of obstructive CAD in patients with stroke, RTA, and elevated uh, troponin levels with suspected concomitant type 1 MI is low, actually low. And the accumulation of uh, uh, the several cardiac risk uh, cardiovascular risk factors and clinical signs of MI were actually predictive. And AS patients with large artery atherosclerosis and elevated troponin may represent an especially vulnerable subgroup of stroke patients with risk of obstructive CAD. So the idea of looking at this study is of course different, but then the people who were followed that 51 patients have done well uh, post uh, PCI and post CABG. So this also shows that retrospective study that the intervention in these patients does good. The next thing is, uh, if you are not going to intervene, what about thrombolysis? So actually this is a, I think a case report rather than number of cases. So acute stroke with concomitant acute myocardial infection, infarction, would you thrombolyze? So here are two things. One is the dose which the neurologist use for thrombolysis, which is alteplase, is a bit different from what we use. We use 100 mg, 10 mg first and 90 mg eventually as two uh, drips uh, over overall one one hour, uh, sorry, two hours, it will be given the thrombolysis, 100 mg. So, alteplase. And this 
our window period like not our whatever the patient presents with a chest pain and st elevation the thrombolysis window period we have is uh, usually 12 hours best as early as possible and if patients have an ongoing pain and you have uh, no cath lab nearby still you can thrombolyze between 12 hours to 24 hours but then remember as you take later they have a risk of ventricular rupture and risk of complications so if 12 hours and 20, if it is 12 to 24 hours or more it is always the prime uh, percutaneous intervention which would be better so this is where uh, this particular subset what we are talking about uh, non hyperacute synchronous cardiocerebral infarction this is another paper wherein uh, this is treated by double interventionist therapy so this is one which uh, can be combined like uh, before going to this i just want to uh, complete this one so here the stroke thrombolysis in stroke is first three hours so uh, if a patient presents within three hours of uh, ais so this particular patient there is no controversy i feel if you have an indication for thrombolysis for stroke then you also have an eventual uh, it is implied that you are going to thrombolyze for cardiac point of view as well so here this patient will definitely benefit and about dose that's all right if you are if a neurologist physician feels it should be half dose it's fine so it's a benefit for the patient who presents with three less than three hours but when then uh, if they are beyond three hours so and a stroke is large so then the issue comes in so thrombolyze thrombolysis would convert the stroke into hemorrhagic stroke or patient can worsen his uh, nihs uh, whatever outcomes so that is what is the uh, debate and i strongly feel in these patients we don't thrombolyze we will go with uh, percutaneous intervention but then the neurologist perspective of view is if i take for percutaneous intervention that one hour would trouble them in uh, managing that uh, window period but this is what is before 3 hours so after 3 hours it's always percutaneous intervention which would be better but again the neurologist perspective is that we give antithrombotics heparin and then we also give the antiplatelet agents uh, ticagrelar kind of thing which is more potent and can convert the infarct into hemorrhagic infarct so we can always error uh, we can always downplay these things like i can uh, do a primary angioplasty wherein i avoid a stent try doing with a balloon for the sake of uh, benefit to the brain and we can always come down with uh, 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 antiplatelet therapy wherein we can give only aspirin avoid if there is no stent we can avoid a p2 p2 vital inhibitor so of course this is my uh, thing my my opinion but then we about evidence we don't have evidence for this in fact any patient the primary pci as per the evidence for us i'll show you the evidence all subsets of patients have been studied and it says it's always primary pci fully thoroughly doing it uh, to prevent uh, the cardiac cardiovascular mortality so these are my ideas which i have told you so what about the next one this is one i felt uh, would be more useful wherein non hyperacute synchronous cardiocerebral infarction treated by double interventionist therapy so we, for example our cath lab ashoda somaji guda we, ha we have a wonderful interventionist in interventionist uh, re interventional radiologist who is always round the clock here and we are there we are there to tackle the uh, heart part of it so we can do a mechanical thrombectomy and then uh, uh, simultaneously like uh, in the case in the cath lab try doing it very fast so you finish see because we can at times finish off uh, primary angioplasty within 15 20 minutes then the next thing we can, can be done is mechanical thrombectomy so whichever is the first if if somebody has a huge st elevation severe pain and then arrhythmias you have to fix this first or other way around so you you can finally do a double interventionist therapy so this is uh, what uh, the substats tells about you can see simultaneous appearance of uh, ami and uh, ais uh, is extremely rare and complex to treat so uh, timely recognition of these conditions is challenging and most of the times is only confirmed by at autopsy of course we know and here the clinical case is uh, who is diagnosed uh, these things after 4 hours 5 hours uh, 
of his clinical condition and mechanical thrombectomy in, with intraarterial thrombolysis and percutaneous uh, intervention to LED has been done and this patient uh, has done well uh, with outcomes which were measured according to modified Rankin score for uh, uh, stroke as well as our uh, cardiology, cardiology out, cardiac outcome has been st uh, studied and it was good. So this is one of the ways we can tackle. This would be one thing. And I also went through one uh, Chinese study, quite interesting, but then it's, I don't know how much it works uh, because he excluded almost every sick patient. Uh, this particular study, which has been uh, in China, a uh, good number of patients have been studied. You can see, I think, uh, study number. So, uh, total of uh, 80 patients around. So, you, they were uh, randomized to two groups. But here, the it is almost a stable patients who have uh, come out of window period. And here, uh, what they have done is they have used the RIC. RIC is... Uh, ischemic condition, conditioning. So ischemic, remote ischemic conditioning. It is nothing but if you look at nowadays, uh, there is something you heard about EECP. So it is external counter pulsation. So they will do a occlusion of upper arm uh, uh, arteries. So for about five hours and then release it, do it uh, for twice a day for about two weeks. And so they have studied the, with a sham RIC wherein uh, they do the uh, inflation up to uh, for 60 mmHg, otherwise uh, in RIC group they do it for uh, 120 mmHg, wherein they cause ischemia to the organs of uh, upper limbs. And the theory is that at a distance there would be uh, the preconditioning in the brain, and it will decrease the amount of stroke, uh, amount of uh, damage in the brain, and uh, similarly in the heart. So this is one study, and which have shown some. Um, uh, uh, as per them, uh, the outcomes have been uh, improved. But I, I won't uh, suggest this for every patient, but this is one uh, I have just gone through uh, just to have an idea about it. Uh, I don't think uh, this would be helpful in uh, people who are sick and in cardiogenic shock and all that. So next is, uh, I have recently heard about uh, the uh, neurologist being uh, worried about giving a uh, thrombolytic especially in a patient who has a previous myocardial infarction. Please, uh, and surprisingly, I don't know, there are only few guidelines and few evidences where uh, it, it is thought as a relative contraindication where somebody has a previous uh, uh, MI. Actually, previous MI doesn't, is not a contraindication for us in the sense when in cardiology practice or in cardiology guidelines, previous myocardial infarction is not a contraindication. There is nothing uh, like uh, a ventricular rupture which happens. It It is, uh, uh, even if it is there, it's a remote chance. So actual absolute indica indica contraindications are, you can see any, of course, any hemorrhage in the brain and known structural cerebrovascular lesions, known malignant intracranial neoplasm, ischemic stroke within three months. Of course, now we have to exclude the first three hours because it's an indication. Suspected aortic dissection and active bleeding. Of, of course, we have to exclude menses. And significant uh, closed head trauma or facial trauma. So all other things would be um, uh, uh, relative. And in that, you can see we don't have... Uh, this, this, is, this comes from the guidelines, recent guidelines, which is uh, 2023 ESC guidelines for uh, thrombolysis in DVT and acute pulmonary embolism. So here... Uh, previous MI doesn't come into picture at all. And for streptokinase, of course, uh, immediately within 48 hours, uh, 24 hours, you can give, but later on, antibodies would develop and you can have an anaphylaxis. So, so you will avoid. And other things you can just go through uncontrolled hypertension uh, and uh, ischemic stroke more than three months and all that. So, uh, non compressible vascular punctures. So, all that. So, again, uh, this is one more table wherein I didn't find any uh, controversy about uh, uh, fibrinolysis uh, uh, being uh, uh, given in previous MI patient. But then uh, look at the fibrin, uh, uh, fibrin specific agents are better. Technically plays, alteplase, ready plays. We have that choice, but uh, and better to give uh, uh, half dose of it in more than 75 years of age. So this is one I just wanted to tell. And then uh, 
so absolute contraindications just look at it platelet count less than one lakh and uh, intracerebral hemorrhage of course and look at here as well there's no prior mi again this comes from ja fetal and this is a fibrinolysis in uh, acs st elevation mi so this i have found in one uh, uh, guideline i'll show you this is again st elevation mi you see in the relative contraindication you don't find any previous mi so just wanted to tell you that it can be safely given and then you have i found this only in the stroke uh, uh, journals wherein they have kept this previous uh, history of st st elevation mi within previous 3 months this was what uh, i was surprised looking at it which uh, we won't uh, consider at all of course now we don't talk about uh, thrombolysis at all we take them for uh, angioplasty majority of times and finally there were 23 randomized trials primary angioplasty versus intravenous thrombolytic therapy and in all this i have gone through these 23 randomized trials abstracts of course and there was no exclusion criteria where an ischemic stroke has been there and primary pci has been done to everyone and the out outcomes have been uh, similar so finally i would uh, lay my this thing on uh, that treatment should be finally individualized and uh, i feel it's always the heart which should be on the upper side of course brain is on the top heart is in middle that way this is okay but then i strongly feel you have to individualize the treatment and uh, it has to be finally the patient you are not treating the heart you are not treating the brain you are treating the patient thank you thanks for the patient listening am i audible oh, i think ah uh, yes yes sir audible sir i am on mute thank you for that uh, elaborate discussion on cerebro cardio cerebral infarction now we will listen from dr mohan krishna on which one to take over good evening everyone so am i audible to everyone yes you are yes yes you yes, see my screen you, your screen yes. is not shared yet share screen yeah i can see now yes it is visible now is it clear yeah we are able to see uh, good evening everyone uh, first of all i thank uh, dr kiran verma sir and the ishoda management to give this opportunity to discuss about this uh, unsolved issue of ca cardio cerebral infarction and uh, dr ravikant sir has told elaborately about the importance of treating heart first and uh, with the literature backed up literature solidly and he has raised a few points also today we will address that in the coming slides so and this will be the overview of my presentation and initially we will go through the introduction briefly and epidemiology and the most important one management what comes first and whether it is heart or brain hopefully we will answer that at the end and uh, sir has pointed out uh, we can see there is increased risk of acute myocardial infarction from the stroke perspective so i will be talking about risk of mi from the stroke perspective neurology perspective and it is true in vice versa also and uh, because obviously the risk factors for both atherosclerotic diseases is same hypertension and age being the most common risk factors and here we can see the stroke incidence following mi is 22 per 1000 in the 3 months following the mi so in when you take the general public the incidence is around 1 to 2 per 1000 and it is usually 10 times 5 times to 10 times more than the general public so the risk is there but there is no controversy in this group of patients on how to treat so as sir has pointed out 
these are the major differences between MI and uh, ischemic stroke, where you can see the uniform etiology in MI, where it is plaque rupture with thrombosis, as I said, red clot and white clot. But coming to the acute ischemic stroke, it is multiple. The so-called uh, toast classification will come, cardioembolic, the source can be cardioembolic, quadriembolic, or thrombus in situ, lacunar, or cryptogenic. In one third of the patient, we will end up finding nothing. And uh, here we can see 95% of the arterial occlusion can be seen in acute, acute myocardial infarction, whereas it is only seen in one third of the patients with acute ischemic stroke. So reperfusion damage, the so-called reperfusion damage resulting in rupture of the vessel because of the sudden increase in the flow is only theoretical. That's why clinically reperfusion benefit is always the rule. And reperfusion is the rule in cardiology. And as Sarah has rightly pointed out, but unfortunately in brain, the age-old dictum of primum non nocere, that means do no harm comes as first. The reperfusion damage is real and the risk compared to the benefit in thrombolysis or after thrombectomy, it is much more compared to without any intervention. But without the intervention, the benefit is more than risk. There is no doubt about that. But the risk is much, much higher. The comparison is between the MI reperfusion strategy versus ischemic reperfusion strategy. Please don't understand that in a way that the benefit versus risk of acute ischemic stroke and any intervention. There is absolutely no doubt. The intervention, either in the form of thrombolysis or thrombectomy, is much more beneficial than non-intervention group or conservative group in a given patient. But compared to the MI, the reperfusion damage is much, much higher, around 6%. And whereas it is less than 0.1% in MI. So the other point, main difference here is the proportion of hospitalized patients who undergo reperfusion therapy. Because the fairly longer period of window period up to 24 hours, as Sir said, in some certain cases, allows the patient to undergo this reperfusion therapy in more than 90%. Whereas in acute ischemic stroke, it is only 10% because the window is narrow and it is short. So these are the available agents for uh, thrombolysis. One is alteplase, the newer one is the tenecteplase, and retaplase is only to the MI. So I don't want to go into the details, but you can see the difference here. So alteplase is given 0 0.9 mg per kg. That is a maximum dose allowed in acute ischemic stroke, whereas it starts with 15 mg bolus, 0 0.75 mg per kg, and it goes for around one and a half hour. The infusion is longer and in acute MI, uh, MI and even in the tenecta place, the maximum dose allowed is 0 0.4 mg per kg in the non-minor strokes, minor strokes with no large vessel occlusion. Whereas in a large vessel occlusion, much smaller dose needs to be given. And the maximum dose allowed in tenecta place in CVI is 20 mg. Whereas it starts with 30 mg in MI. So the dose is higher and the duration of infusion in the case of alteplase is longer. So what are the implications here? We can see in a patient with acute ischemic stroke, 100% if you take, 85% that is 4 is to 1 is the ratio of acute ischemic stroke, which is more common. And among them, 40% will present as large vessel occlusion. And among them, only 10% will come in less than 3 hours. Out of 100 patients, only 10% will be eligible for thrombolysis or thrombectomy by the time they reach the hospital. So coming to our today topic, that is cardiocerebral infarction. So it is not nothing new, but it was first described by Omar et al. So as a concomitant acute ischemic stroke and acute myocardial infarction. So then the interest started how to deal with this. Then people have started looking back. So the, as you can see, the stroke management landscape, especially in the initial management in the initial 24 hours, has shifted very much in the past 15 years. So obviously the data is going in line with that. So the guideline in 2013 kept on changing, which I will be discussing now. And the cardiocerebral infarction can be classified as synchronous cardiocerebral infarction, which is a simultaneous infarction in the cerebral and coronary vascular arteries. Whereas the other point is metachronous cardiocerebral infarction, which is one event preceding the other. So either MI coming, after CVA or CVA coming after MI, at least in the subacute phase, up to 72 hours is the arbitrary timeline, which is given. And the majority of the literature, which was seen, the majority of cases are coming into the category of metachronous cardiocerebral infarction, where there is a little doubt 
on how to deal with the patient. The doubt is with the synchronous cardiocerebral infarction. So this is the epidemiology, which is not very useful to discuss because the definitions were not there and uh, the data is retrospective. The definitions were applied and the cases were included in for the data analysis after the definition was done. It is not a prospective data in majority of the cases. Here you can see as far as the data goes in 1984. So the prevalence is high by Rocky et al. Initially, they presented with that the Chin et al. He presented CCI 12.7% more in geriatric patients, whereas the GRACE trial reported incidence of 0.9%. The incidence was much higher in patients with STEMI. The most recent of all is EO et al. In 2017, he showed that 6% of patients with acute stroke had HT segment elevation in mind. So in 2023, a meta-analysis of these data, which is already not reliable, was done. And there are several characteristics with the available data. The most common MI was anterior STEMI. In the meta-analysis, if you take any case, individual case series, some people have presented inferior wall STEMI as the most common. But this is a meta-analysis, which showed the anterior STEMI as the most common 40% followed by inferior wall STEMI. Most common culprit region in the cranial arteries, as with other group of people, is middle cerebral artery, left being more prevalent than the right. And the most common cause of this CCI was cardiogenic shock and heart failure followed by atrial fibrillation. The mortality rate at the time of hospital discharge and the majority of the patients die if they die in within 72 hours it is one third, 33%. And if you take compare and put it to put it in the perspective, the majority of stroke patients who present with large vessel occlusion also, the mortality is around 5% or less than that. And at the end of the day, at the end of three months, which is the trial primary outcomes which we take at the end of 90 days, the mortal day is 50%. This was without treatment, without interventions available and without thrombolysis available. The meta-analysis showed there is 50% chance of mortality at the end of three months in patients who have CCI, this cardiocerebral infarction. So the majority of deaths is presumably because of the cardiac causes, either in the form of arrhythmias or tamponade or septal rupture or sudden death. So what causes this? The most, there are three mechanisms which are uh, proposed. The number one is concurrent cardiocerebral infarction, that is simultaneous thrombosis of coronary and cerebral arteries, which is commonly seen in atrial fibrillation. Rarely seen in type 1 aortic dissection, fortunately it is very rare, which can involve both coronary artery and common carotid artery. And electrical injury, which can cause dissection in both the groups. And the other one with the recent context, drug abuse, especially Maruna, it can cause vasoconstriction and spasms, transient spasms in both coronary and cerebral arteries. And the second most clinically common cause, the second most mechanism is acute MI leading to cerebral infarction. A right ventricular MI can cause hypotension leading into border zone infarcts or intraventricular thrombosis because of the region of motion abnormality can cause MI or congestive cardiac failure after acute MI resulting in brain stroke. So the another interesting mechanism uh, that is the stunned myocardium, so-called neurogenic stunning myocardium. This is a cerebral cardiac axis. So as we know, the middle cerebral artery, the cortical branches of the middle cerebral artery, they supply to the insular cortex on either side. And the right side, Insular cortex is the control for sympathetic control and whereas the left side insular cortex is control for the parasympathetic cortex. That means if the patient has right side infarction, sympathetic will be less and patient is more prone for increased parasympathetic activity leading to acetyl. Whereas if it is involving on the left side, increased sympathetic activity in the form of tachyarrhythmias. In other words, neurogenic stunning myocardium resulting in autonomic fluctuations resulting in a stressed myocardium or MI. So coming to the topic, which one is first? Are they both equal? Can they ever be equal? Or is it your word versus my word? So coming to the first thing, why Sar said there are no evidence-based guidelines. And uh, Sar has told about the particular scenario where previous MI being a contraindication for stroke thrombolysis, the proposal mechanism was the fibrin clot which was protecting from the cardiac rupture and because of the fibrinolysis later, because of the stroke in the recent MI case can result in the rupture. There are few case reports supporting to the guideline, but it is not evidence-based. So it is based on case reports, which we are proposing and discussing right now. 
So this all what we are discussing now may turn out to be false in the future. We need to take all this literature into with pinch of salt. So there is no evidence. It is not a settled topic. And the challenge to risk management is because of the different dosage. If you thrombolyze, which dose you give? And which do you prefer? And as Sir said, MI, in MI, PCI is the standard of care wherever it is available. And now it is widely available, especially in our center or in, in our state also in periphery centers. And where one of them is not available, like thrombolysis for stroke is not available or PCI is not available, then there is no issue. But in our tertiary care centers where everything is available, now we need to address this topic. So the ideal management strategy is we need to find a treatment which can increase the vascularity in both territories. So, but the problem with this increasing how it is, the mechanism to increase in MI is through percutaneous intervention. That is the ideal treatment of choice. Whereas in the neuro is, it is thrombolysis first followed by thrombectomy in a given case. So what are the options? The choice of treatment varies from conservative management. I have encoded this one patient, particular patient with MI and uh, concomitant CVA. So in 2015, when I was in training, so at that time, the uh, treatment that was chosen was conservative management, do nothing, and the patient expired after two days. And with antithrombotics, or to the aggressive treatment, or do endovascular therapy, both for the coronary, as well as these are the two extremes. Is there a balance? That's what we need to find out. And, uh, and the confusion comes because both are available now. So endovascular thrombectomy is available widely, and percutaneous interventions are becoming more available widely and uh, the choice becomes more complex and independent management of one thrombosis artery will obviously delay the treatment in the other vascular bed. So if you focus on one, you tend to lose the other and we have to individualize and moreover, the optimal order of PCA and endovascular thrombectomy remains unclear even in the cases presented, the literature presented by Dr. Ravi Kansar also, it showed that the cases are reported, the problem with case reported is only some of them are reported. It is not a randomized controlled data. So where you know in a particular way of treatment what happened. So this is the choice where the patient improved and they might have presented. That can lead to the bias. So all the options are available. I'm just going through this briefly in 2013. So this is at the time of my training. The American Heart Association is very clear. The patient is presenting with concomitant uh, acute ischemic stroke and a cerebral infarction, sorry, myocardial infarction, the patient presents with three to four and a half hour window period. Treatment is only RTPA for the stroke. So nothing to do from the stroke side for the heart. This is the American Heart Association guideline, which got changed in 2018. So in patients with concurrent cardiocerebral infarction within 24.5 hours, because the window period got extended up to four and a half hours, they should be given EPA at stroke dose and followed by percutaneous intervention. But the problem here is the evidence is class 2 AC. That means it is also dependent on the retrograde literature or case series. So the European stroke guidelines, if you see stroke organization 2021 guidelines, it is a little more complicated. And uh, if the window period, if the patient presents with concomitant AMA less than six hours, so all the place should be administered if there are no contraindication for the stroke dose and mechanical thrombectomy is effective with large vessel occlusion and recent myocardial infarction. So even with emergent and aggressive treatments with all these guidelines and even with this, as I said before, without any therapy with conservative management at the end of three months, the mortality is 50%. Even with this, the mortality is still devastating, which I will discuss later in a recent study. So the recent uh, named the concomitant CCI, the name proposed by Kichpai Salratna in 2017 as hyperacute simultaneous cardio cerebral infarction. It's a sophisticated name to give a particular subset of patients to dichotomize them from the metachronous cardio cerebral infarcted patients, which form the chunk of the literature which we are reviewing. So, to dichotomize these patients from those, he has coined this name to patients who are presenting in less than four and a half hours. But the problem is, in 2017, the window period for stroke thrombolysis is four and a half hours. But in 2024, the stroke thrombolysis window period is eight hours. And the mechanical thrombectomy was not standard of care at that time. And it is only up to six hours. Now it can be done in up to 24 hours. So this is also the definition given by him in 2017 cannot be applied now. 
and uh, he has proposed this for patients with cardiocerebral infarction mind you the previous guidelines i will go back once and they have given so you do thrombolysis wherever it is possible for the stroke dose followed by pci or not and uh, for this he has dichotomized these patients again into patients with hemodynamic instability and hemodynamic instability mind you is a contraindication for thrombolysis itself and they take these patients into emergency pci and followed by intravascular treatment for acute ischemic stroke if they have large vessel occlusion so don't do thrombolysis in hemodynamic instability which is a contraindication in those patients do with pci followed by evt if it is feasible but with stable hemodynamics rtpa is the treatment of choice to do first so stroke with rtpa thrombolysis comes first followed by endovascular therapy either for the ischemic stroke or for the mi depending on the situation in particular patient so this is the model proposed by him 2017 and these are the various case reports so i will not go through every part but you can see so fibrinolysis pci percutaneous and mechanical thrombectomy and were done in majority of the patients and they were not done conservative was tried death was the result thrombolysis done patient died and none of them done they again patient died and thrombolysis and with pci and no stunting that is clot as creation presumably followed by anticoagulation good outcome and only stunting with no thrombolysis or thrombectomy and outcome is not defined here at the end of 3 months and with stunting mrs is good and tenecteplase thrombolysis only thrombolysis mrs is one in the particular case and all these are tried so in this if you see these case reports patient who have not undergone any intervention they have died uniformly and any one intervention have they have reported some improvement or they are alive at least at the end of 3 months so so is there a particular case series pertaining only to these patients fortunately so this is come from the al shifa hospital from palestine and uh, this they have seen only this particular case of patients that is cardio cerebral infarcted patients and uh, in this series they have this is the largest series in the literature so far available they have included 94 patients and over few years and uh, they have at the time of discharge you can see 72 patients total number of patients interventions 15 were done at the end of discharge and uh, at the end of 3 months 59 patients were alive and i will go through the details and in these 94 patients the most common according to the meta analysis before also it is anterior st segment elevation mi and followed by inferior segment mi inferior wall mi and in the brain anterior left anterior descending artery is the most common sorry this is also in the mi part and in the brain if you see middle cerebral artery right and left and left is more common than the right followed by basilar artery and internal carotid artery this is more or less as in the meta analysis with the previous literature also and alteplase was given in 41 patients of 94 and intervention procedures the percutaneous intervention was done in 29 patients and with balloon only with in nine patients with aspiration only in one patient and bare metal stent was put in three patients whereas drug eluting stent was put in 16 patients mechanical thrombectomy was performed in 25% that is 24 patients and only 21 were treated in combination with pci and mechanical thrombectomy that means they have other other things so with all these interventions so this is a tertiary care hospital where everything similar to our hospital where endovascular intervention for stroke and cardiac mi is available and thrombolysis is also available and here you can see after these interventions hospital mortality is seen in 13 13.3% of patients in the intervention group whereas it is seen in 38.6% in the treatment only conservative group and 90 day mortality is seen in 24% even with the intervention and whereas medical intervention it is only it is 60% so when you club all these patients so at the time of discharge 72 patients and the mrs is 24 33% of the patients mrs 6 is there that means 33% have died at the time of discharge and whereas at the end of 3 months 50% of the patients are discharged the problem with this part is it has combined both medical and intervention part and but here we can see they have clearly reported that the medical intervention intervention part either in the form of mechanical thrombectomy or pci as a definite edge over the conservative part so finally this is the only article available recently done case series 
particular only to this patient. This is not a retrospective analysis or independent case series. So in the live case scenario, what do we do? What is the take home message? So if the patient at the time of presentation, if it is he, if he is hemodynamically unstable, if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, percutaneous intervention, heart should be given more weightage according to the literature. And because hemodynamically unstable patients are contraindicated for thrombolysis. But if the patient is hemodynamically stable, brain should be given first priority and patient should always be done thrombolysis first followed by eligibility for the percutaneous intervention, even though some time is lost. But over time, in the past 11 years, American Heart Association guidelines, American Stroke Association, European Stroke Association guidelines, all these in favor of doing thrombolysis for stroke in a patient who is eligible for stroke thrombolysis, especially in the patient, if the patient is hemodynamically stable. So this is a flowchart given saying the same thing, stroke onset less than 400 hours and myocardial infarction less than 12 hours, that is concomitant, concurrent MI with stroke. So brain MRA, CT brain should be done and if can be, if patient is hemodynamically stable. Patient is hemodynamically unstable, then there is no question, emergency PCI. If the patient is hemodynamically unstable, then we have to see intravenous thrombolysis. Then there is no confusion in this also. And if there is a large vessel occlusion, endovascular treatment for stroke should be done. And in this scenario, and if there is no large vessel occlusion, only medical management. So if there is in the initial percutaneous intervention is not done, patient is can be done after the thrombolysis. So thank you. So, so I have a lot of clarity. I have no problem at all now. I think uh, the debate is now open. So I think I thought you will fight with me. Then uh, you didn't fight with me. So both of you make us awestruck in your presentations and it is difficult for us to initiate the debate now. Mm, so it's quite uh, what I find now. I think Dr. Kiran and you should ask us. So I, I have a crystal clear idea now very clear, a crystal clear idea what to do in what patient now. Yes. So, the, it's the so problem bad. comes where there is no evidence and there is no evidence here in this particular scenario. And uh, the present flowchart or guidelines are based on expert opinions. And uh, in the history of science, both in cardiology and neurology, there are ample examples. Expert opinions turned out to be false. And they were revised again. And but this sounds to in the hemodynamically stable patient. So uh, I got the impression that sir, after the SAR presentation, wherever it is possible, percutaneous intervention should be the priority. And uh, that in needs, I wanted to clarify a little in that aspect. But even though patient might be eligible for percutaneous intervention, if the patient is hemodynamically stable, he should be considered first for thrombolysis as of things stands now. Stroke for thrombolysis at the stroke dose and uh, followed by percutaneous intervention or endovascular thrombectomy depending on the case to case basis in fact the only uh, thing uh, sorry to interrupt you in fact the same thing i told because if it is in window period for uh, as acute ischemic stroke yes i always think that it would be the thrombolysis which would be there provided the the patient has not uh, like no hemodynamic uh, instability and the patient has tolerable pain, no arrhythmias, all that. So first three hours, there's no doubt about it. It's beyond three hours of presentation after AAS. So yes, that is where we have to discuss, I think. So the uh, one aspect of it is as uh, cardiology, the golden period of MI kept on increasing. The same thing is happening with the stroke also, sir. Okay. Now, even for thrombolysis, the stroke thrombolysis can be given up to eight to nine hours because of the advanced imaging we have okay. at our disposal. So we have perfusion studies, which we are doing routinely if the patient is outside four and a half hours. And now comes the problem is the time lost. And uh, is, the, is it actually causing MI to worsen if you are losing time? So to get these angiograms done and all, so one clarity regarding that was uh, we don't need to get the advanced imaging done because 
thrombectomy versus percutaneous intervention we can individualize case to case basis but thrombolysis versus percutaneous patient percutaneous intervention thrombolysis comes first followed by percutaneous intervention if patient is eligible for thrombolysis so what is the experience about uh, double interventions where the patient uh, can go for uh, thrombectomy and uh, pci intervention where so you actually, can test where it is available from my side i can tell you one example which is actually not in cci see we have a different situation most of the times what happens is when we were doing when when we are doing a pci or when we are doing an angiography when we are not intervening we are doing an invasive work like a angiography also rarely we uh, get a patient uh, with uh, to have a posterior circulation stroke or an anterior circulation stroke so we ask uh, then uh, we ask for help with the neurophysician and uh, on table we would uh, go with the neuro intervention so i feel uh, wherever possible this kind of approach can be tried provided again uh, the patient is hemodynamically unstable uh, unstable it's always pci with mechanical thrombectomy which works i feel that that would be the uh, thing but then if you are asking about particular cci cardio cerebral infarction simultaneous presentation this particular group we have never done double intervention we have never done it i am talking about post pci and post angio because one of the patients uh, i can tell you one scenario uh, uh, two examples i can tell you one is uh, cci where the patient has presented to us with simultaneous uh, isch acute ischemic stroke and acute coronary syndrome but this patient was almost out of window period for heart and the patient was almost stable so we did an angiogram eventually then stented then he is under follow up for two and a half years he stopped all medication he came he came back with stroke this time i think mohana krishna has seen this patient yes and the patient actually we lost him after two and a half years because he dropped down uh, uh, in the bank where he works and he had a isch acute ischemic stroke recurrent stroke so first time it was stroke with uh, mi out of window period we took time and uh, did an angiogram and fixed the coronary artery disease and two and a half years after that uh, i'm this is one example i am telling you which could like uh, we have uh, nothing to do there because the patient had uh, was out of window period for both so leave about him the other example is i had one patient who came to my private clinic where, with uh, a, acute myocardial infarction uh, he is 22 year old so he doesn't smoke he doesn't have any comorbidities so he is a software engineer so then i have seen that it is an st elevation mi i told him immediately you have to get admitted he left uh, we we have given loading dose in the clinic and he didn't come to the hospital and the next day uh, his friend uh, comes in and says we will get him for an angiogram he survived the myocardial infarction uh, it is an anterior st elevation mi survived it so he came to uh, ashoda for angiogram we did it the angiogram showed it it is afternoon 12 o'clock we did it this is a decade ago the patient had distal lad total occlusion and echocardiogram was done and it is not showing any lv clot or anything then at 12 o'clock this was done 430 i got a call from iccu saying that patient had a seizure then we could realize that it was a stroke acute ischemic stroke with uh, dense hemiplegia and at that time we had uh, ranadeer uh, as our neurosurgeon we didn't have an uh, immediate intervention ke liye nobody was there so ranadeer took a, took into the cath lab and we both uh, tried doing opening it it was an internal carotid artery occlusion with a uh, huge thrombus and uh, despite our efforts we couldn't save him so this is one example where uh, a, it was actually not pci intervention but then it is a coronary angiogram followed by a stroke and we lost him he donated the organs those days so that's one i have seen one more example one few examples i'll tell you fast one is i've done uh, angioplasty finished angioplasty i removed the catheter about to go out uh, then suddenly the patient said i am and i am seeing everything double so then i stood, stood at uh, his side and asked him uh, Uh, what's happening then he said if i am looking at you you are two if i am looking at left it is one so it's clearly posterior circulation stroke i uh, i said uh, we'll do something and uh, 
uh, ACT, I have given a, an extra dose of uh, heparin at that time. Uh, I am not, I am sure that it is not a bleed. But somehow, he responded immediately. By the time we shifted him, he is alright. And it was a transient ischemic attack. The pa patient was, everything was alright. We had a neurology consultation, everything is alright. So that is one where it spontaneously recovered. Similar kind of pictures have happened on the table, which recovered by themselves. By the time they came out. And one of them had uh, like, uh, I've done an angio two years ago. He came for an angiogram. I said, we usually don't do every time angiogram. He said, I want to get it done. He had a triple vessel disease, medical management. So we did it, diffuse disease. He was uh, shifted to ward. I'm making a round, making a discharge ready. So then I could see again. He said, I'm looking at you. It is double vision. So... I found this kind of strokes do happen, but they spontaneously recover majority of times. When it is dense hemiplegia, dense uh, things, then the problem comes in. So uh, uh, these are the situations where uh, uh, several times interventional radiologist comes in with a neurology team. And finally, they fix up the problem 50% uh, of times, I feel. And uh, I had two cases till now in 20 years, wherein we had a hemorrhagic stroke. One after doing everything, shifted to room on the same day evening. Hemorrhagic stroke, ACT was good, heparin doses were good, antithrombotic therapy is proper, there is nothing overdose, nothing, and we couldn't explain. So patient, uh, we could, he didn't survive. The second one was, third day, of, third day is getting discharged. So even that, uh, that it was an hemorrhagic uh, stroke and uh, he also was on to ventilator and all that. So these are very few, you can remember the people's uh, like uh, names of the uh, patients. So I just to tell you, but CCI is absolutely rare phenomenon. I have seen only three patients and we didn't intervene in any patient. Right. Well, as far as uh, I, we have recently seen one patient who has a posterior circulation stroke. It's a lacunar info and he has with the MI. So MI PTCA was done because it's a lacunar stroke and patient already is a minor stroke. So he is not eligible for thrombolysis in the sense that NHS is only two. So that's why we went ahead with the PTCA. Now the context here is because of the increased interventions, if you see the mortality of either MI or stroke, so it is much, much less with each passing decade. So there are more patients who had history of CVA who are alive now, and more, more patients who had MIs, like some patients have three, four stunts like that. So still they are alive with no much morbidity. So with increased number of patients with these comorbidities, and uh, there is increased risk of this thing happening in the elderly people. And uh, one particular subset of patients are young strokes, young patients, and uh, with increased use of drug abuse. And uh, we might see so there are only few case reports, one or two, and we have actually presented like that. But the proposal mechanism is there in the form of either viral infection and which can cause so coronary spasm and which can cause uh, carotid spasm too. So in the form of vasospasm can be seen in young strokes too. So these are the two particular set of patients who have undergone previous history of multiple interventions okay, who are at risk of this concomitant MI with AAS. And the other one is young patients who are drug abuse. I, I just went through one of the recent literatures which was saying that double intervention can be used for that's a 2023 uh, article. If you remember, you must have churned the literature. Yes, yes, yes. I, I've actually, actually presented actually that. Yes, you presented that actually. So it can be used, madam. No problem with that in using. The problem yes. is so how useful it is. That's the problem. So again, we, we need a lot of research in this area to see which is best. But uh, for emergency physicians, whoever sees these uh, concomitant cardiocerebral infarctions, CT or MRI modality is as important as doing an ECG now. So exactly. do both the, in, in, uh, both the investigations and then see if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, the patient can go for PCI. If the patient yeah. is hemodynamically stable, we can thrombolyze at a stroke dose and then plan for uh, PCI. Yes. So I, yes. I think uh, there's not much of a debate. I think all of us are on the same page. <laughs> what do you say, Dr. Ravikant? Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's yeah. basically uh, 
we were discussing yesterday uh, yes. and uh, it's uh, it's actually common sense but then com whether your common sense is uh, uh, evidence by evidence backed up later on i we don't know you have to individualize the patient and as you said we are all thinking similar yes. as of now so one point uh, last point i want to add here is uh, the if you see the guideline they want to do in a hemodynamically stable patient it is advised to do a angiography done first so the simple reason because the patients who have concomitant acute ischemic stroke with mi so there is a remote possibility of aortic dissection which is a contraindication for thrombolysis so if a patient is hemodynamically stable even though we might lose few minutes for the mi percutaneous intervention the patient is stable especially if the patient has both mi and cva so it is always preferable to get a angio done not only to rule out large vessel occlusion but also to rule out dissection that's nice and one last question uh, for both of you what is the experience of arrhythmia recognition in these cases of ischemic strokes because uh, recurrent strokes one of the reason we say is uh, thrombus due to atrial fibrillation and even the guidelines are saying that after stroke we need to do a continuous ecg monitoring so yeah, right. what is the proportion we are finding arrhythmias and is there anything that we can do because arrhythmias is another thing that the er physician should be aware of it atrial fibrillation is quite common and uh, as uh, anyone ages if you take above 80 years uh, even in general public also more than 10% of people will have atrial fibrillation it's a big number huge number yes so atrial fibrillation is one which is responsible for strokes especially non valvular atrial fibrillation you don't have a structural heart disease but atrial fibrillation would uh, uh, end up with uh, a embolic stroke so that is why uh, there is a beautiful like uh, the guidelines are so clear evidence is so clear in atrial fibrillation whom to start aspirin whom to start uh, dual antiplatelet whom to give an anticoagulant so when it comes to reason atrial fibrillation has a reason to uh, stroke it's well established well understood very clear and in this clinical scenario especially in the patients with CA, the cci we are talking about Uh, uh, cardio cerebral infarction if it is a right ventricular myocardial infarction or an inferior wall myocardial infarction more likely that this patient would have an atrial fibrillation and embolic stroke that is because proximal rca occlusions are responsible for atrial fibrillations uh, as per research as per evidence so this subset of patients can have a atrial fibrillation and this is a different pathology where there is an embolic stroke it it actually is one of the as a, there was a flow chart which showed one of the reasons is atrial fibrillation which is responsible for simultaneous service there little context i want to add here madam uh, actually the af as sir said it is the most common cause and uh, there is a subset called paroxysmal af af so that means the paroxysmal af need not be there for hours together ecg can be normal in a patient with af so how much time we actually need AF to be there to cause a stroke, AF needs to be at least 30 seconds. So if it is 30 seconds, 30 seconds out of their lifetime is enough to cause brain stroke. And the other part uh, I wanted to tell is uh, in a patient, the, uh, the arrhythmias can be transient. And uh, some of them, in fact, many of them in a stroke patient can happen because of the stroke itself, as I said before, because of the insular cortex involvement. Or they may turn out later with the initial ECG being normal. so that's why the whole term monitoring needs to be done in undiagnosed case so as far as we go up to 28 days also in a rare case scenario but the rule of thumb is if you are not able to find the source of thrombus treat as cardioembolic so that is called cryptogenic stroke or embolic stroke of unknown source es us should be treated as cardioembolic because these arrhythmias are trans transient and uh, the ventricular arrhythmias all you need is 10 seconds to 50 seconds to cause cerebral ischemia and hypoxia so that's why we need to treat if you are able to find a cardiac source which can be treated with as sir said like stunting or cabg like that and that is good enough and if you are not able to find any source and if the patient has recurrent cva especially with unknown source it should be treated as cardioembolic the idea behind that is arrhythmias 
So and uh, again, in the shelf now we have a uh, good Novax. We have a uh, Novax which are uh, having less side effects. You you are worried about bleeding in cases of uh, anticoagulation. So the Novax in the shelf you can always uh, start them when it is a cryptogenic stroke or when when you contemplate uh, atrial fibrillation, which as he said is paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, not persistent or uh, uh, permanent. If you have a paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, persistent and permanent atrial fibrillation. So paroxysmal is spontaneously, which goes away. So especially in no structural heart disease. So that is one of the real places where you need an anticoagulant, especially patients more than 75 years of age. Uh, so, uh, or, or if uh, there is a stroke with uh, uh, this thing, of course, we have CHAT score. That is the next topic which we can always discuss. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. thank you, Dr. Ravi, Ravi Kiran and Dr. Mohan Krishna for an elaborative and extensive discussion on uh, concomitant uh, cerebral, cardiocerebral infarctions. And thank you so much for both of you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, good night. Good night. Good night.